uh, blue back river herring. And it was uh, very important to this region, either with northeastern North Carolina, because <clears throat> they were prolific and there was an easy way to get them, and it was a lot of protein for a little bit of effort. And all the, all the uh, <coughs> colonial members of this area try to take advantage of them because, uh, like I said, there, there were so many of them. Now, when I mean so many of them, uh, <coughs> my great-grandfather and his great-grandfather, <laughs> uh, they, they could sell a hundred herrings for one penny, and that was a hundred herrings that were were gutted and salted, a hundred of them for one cent. So if one herring was worth one hundredth of a cent. Uh, inflation had gone up quite a bit since then, and uh, but and they, they uh, have suffered a lot of problems. Over the debt, well, over the centuries, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but getting on with the story here, <clears throat> um, this this fishery was so valuable that waterfront property or farmland was bought not for its agricultural value, but for its fishery value, because it was such a volume was you know cocaine crop in the day or something. They, uh, they can make more money off of it. So practically every bit of waterfront property that they could pull a haul seine, which is a very long net that, you know, catches fish into, you know, <clears throat> into a, a single mass that covers a, a large, large acreage of the bottom and you can pull them, pull them into a small area and get them. Anywhere that they could get a net, a haul seine, they would, they would try, you know, and get a fishery started there. And they would use, at first, it was horsepower to pull these nets in, literally horsepower. And then it went to uh, steam, type steam uh, generators, locomotive type engines that would do, you know, the, uh, the heavy lifting. And on the, on the shoreline, they would have their little, little buildings put up, and they would, you know, head and gut. At that time, I think they just gutted them when they left their heads on them. Uh, this would be, you know, in the mid-18th century. And they would saw them, clean them, saw them up, and pack them in a wooden barrel. I remember, some of y'all may remember this, that the... Um, evening fish house used to be down here and you could actually go down there and see those old barrels that they had that they packed the herring in. Is that but, where the brew pubs going in? Is so that what? Where, is that where the brew pubs going in? Is that where you're talking no, about? No, I'm talking about uh, where Richard Elliott's house is. Uh, there was, you said, and then by the early, it's, I guess by the mid-70s it had gone to a poly vinyl chlorine wrappers that still, you know, wooden um, when uh, barrel stays, uh, if somebody would like to uh, hand them, i pass that down so you get a feel for what salt herrings, some of y'all got a pretty good idea what it is. When, <clears throat> when I was young, just to give you a hand of those, when I was young <laughs> and I was in elementary school, you could always tell who had pickled herrings for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> because you could smell it on them. <laughs> I mean, because you pick on them, you, you could smell it, you know, it was a very, you know, strong odor on because they, you know, kind of heavy on that, but you tell who had pickled and it, people ate them all the time. And um, I cultivated a taste for them, and uh, I dragged her from pillow to post, <laughs> finding somewhere that, that fries, pickled herrings the way I like them, and I like them uh, pretty crispy. Some people call them cremated, but I like them. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they are crispy. They're, they're very tasty on it. Uh, I enjoy them. But anyway, so every, everything's going along great, and the herring fisheries, and the, uh, the people that had the largest fisheries were processing 
huge amounts of these blueback river herons, and I mean millions of them. And they ended up in all kinds of trades. One of the one of the um, large that our great great grandfather was in, he was processing herons, and they were shipped down to the Gulf Coast, and into Florida, and into Savannah, wherever, and they ended up as a food source for the slavers that were coming back from Africa because it was a cheap way to feed you know, people and they were looking for cheap. And that was one of you so that I, that I was amazed to find out that it was made it that far all the way to, to the west coast of Africa to, uh, to uh, feed the uh, slave traders or the slaves themselves. And they got here, so they, they had developed a taste for pivotal herring before they got here, I guess, because <laughs> it, it, uh, it was very popular, and that went on because, I mean, I like them, everybody I talked to, I mean, I mean you know, it's kind of like uh, ice cream. I was <laughs> growing up here, everybody did like them, I mean, everybody enjoyed them uh, because I guess they were so ubiquitous in, in this area. We were fortunate that we had them and people were, uh, people were able to catch them. And, um, and we put them up, we get them in the spring of the year, and they come in a huge, you know, run of herring is what we would call it. And uh, they would, they'd be, like I was talking about with, with saying this, that was primarily, that was where they were called. And that, that involved a lot of labor to, catch herrings on quote unquote an industrial scale by using uh, human labor to do it. But they did that and some horses around the caps and they pull them in. And then they stay up all night and they would gut them, clean them, and pack them in salt. And get them prepared for any shipment they could. And generally they went, like I said, to the poor regions that you needed a food source that was relatively cheap. And it was because you know, Mother Nature provided it, all you had to do was catch it. It wasn't like raising beef cattle or anything. It was there. And it went right ahead. And then after, after the Civil War, it kept pro progressing where people had, you know, had a taste for it, and, you know, white, black, or whatever was enjoy, well, I shouldn't say enjoy, I guess I did, I enjoyed them, you know, all people enjoyed them, but uh, it was, it was uh, food that was, you know, uh, you know, primary item for this area. And the further north you went, it was less than further south you went. But for some reason, coastal North Carolina, the Admiral Science, especially up Chilwana River, this is where you wanted to be if you were in the herring fishery. And it's going along pretty good uh, for the fishery at that time uh, for, for, for quite a while. And then the biggest change that came to the herring fishery was the food stamp system. And when the food stamp system came in, it was people that were on public assistance or whatever didn't, didn't no longer needed to buy the cheapest thing that they could get. They could, you know, as they say, you know, eat higher up on the hog, you know. And the demand for herring started to drop off as the uh, food stamp system got rolling. That was, uh, that had, and... People that were used to eating it or fixing it didn't do it. Cause it you got to start the day before. You got to soak them out. You know, got to fry them up. You know, it, it was a little bit. They could find something that was less labor intensive for breakfast. Than, well, hell, I like them for dinner, or lunch, whenever I could get them. But that was one thing that the food stamp system made them less in demand. I guess is what I should say. And um, it went downhill from there. But uh, then, um, 
that started started to decrease in the popularity of it. And I mean, when I was involved, I mean, a lot of y'all probably with Yoda. I mean, everybody had purple herons. You try to go find some purple herons now. Where are you going to get them? I mean, it's a hit or miss at the grocery store, if that's your thing. You know, a lot of people, it's just, just too smelly or whatever, and I agree that they do have an odor to them. <laughs> that uh, some people might find a little objective uh, to it. But then, uh, because it was a great thing, it was, like I said, it was moving right along, everything was fine. They went from, let me say, bring this in there too, but I need to say it. The, the same fishery where you had these, you know, uh, sign front plantations that had long beaches. In fact, there's one that's even called Long Beach, but that were fortunate enough to have a sandy beach up there that they could land a, a, a sane on. Uh, and it was so labor intensive that they went to what was called the Dutch net because that worked. The Dutch net is the pine net, and it be, it was the ultimate. And I got a photograph. I mean, a drawing of one where it's just a barrier that forces fish into a small confined area, and you can get them out with a dip net. And that became a that was easy. Instead of having a crew of literally thirty to fifty people out there trying to catch, you could have a few of those and three or four guys can go out there and catch, you know, thousands of pounds of them and it's less labor intensive. And thanks to the Dutch, that's how we got it. It's called, they referred to it originally as a Dutch net and it was a pine because of the, uh, the herring were, com were corralled in a pine. And you go out there literally with a dip net and dip them out. And that went on, you know, till they left and uh, worked real good. Uh, when I was a little boy, I remember going out and cutting pine net steaks. And that was a lucrative business. If you had a little energetic and family had a little bit of land, so you could, you know, cut down some gum steaks, then yeah, you were, you were on your way. So, um, where the hell I was going with the rest of that, but anyway, <laughs> the, <laughs> that 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 worked out pretty good. And the other thing to to know about the pine net fishery, and it did it 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 uh, it brought riparian rights, the the legal terms for riparian right on ownership of you know the shorelines because it was very very competitive. I mean. It's kind of hard to believe this, but I was looking at a, a map that the state of North Carolina, and they literally had thousands of these pine net sets between Terrell County and up to uh, Cannons Ferry, and they were all registered because it was it was very lucrative that was in it. So um, they uh, I had to keep all that straight, but the fishery goes on and it survives, and it, everybody makes a little bit of money at it. And uh, then, and then uh, the water water quality issues started going to pieces. You know, I mean by water quality issues was the the farm runoff was a big problem for Blueback River. Hand. Blueback River herring are like the canary in the coal mine when the when you had the, well originally it was mostly with, with fertilizers, but then it went to pesticides and insecticides that were in farm runoff. And years ago I was at a meeting and um, the guy said, well, you know, well, why can't we just limit the number of pesticides in or you know, insecticides, fertilizer. And the guy said, well, let me put this in perspective. He said, you've got, you know, $25 billion worth of agriculture in the state of North Carolina. And he says, you've got over here, you know, $5 million worth of fisheries. Now, which one do you think is going to survive? <laughs> you know, and it, and it is. And here I am, 70 years old, and it's the same story. And even if you could... 
it's got a lot of problems. It really does. And I want to say that the, the idea of pollution, I'm going to harp on that a little while because I've been fighting that a long time. But the agriculture to for the state, when you get right down to it, which one do you, I shouldn't be on a political part of it, but which one do you think is more important? Those Blue Black River herring or, you know, all these all this food that they need to raise to take care of this population and ship overseas. So of course the blue backs are, are going to lose on on something like that. The uh, and the other part of that was and I left that out too was the part to believe, but and I'm not just beating up on women that said this, but years ago in England they, they discovered that uh, birth control pills affect fish, and since then they've done a lot of studies on it, and it is true that birth, but so does heart medicine, has a big effect, diabetes medicine, anything that can pass through your system and come out and get into a municipal sewer system and then make it through a municipal sewer system and it gets into what we call a water column. And it's, once it's inside of the water column, anything and everything that, that needs a drink of water is going to get some of that. So, uh, that's another one. <laughs> if you think agriculture is a lot of money, big farmers got some money too. So, they're not going to let you even start thinking about that. But it's a, a, it's a, a species that is very... Um, affected by its environment and its environment, you know, has degradation of the, of the water column. It's, it's nowhere near what it was. Now, <clears throat> Carly told me that when she was young, <coughs> that this was 15 cents a can. <laughs> now, this is not even, what it did say on that last one I looked at, let me tell you, too. it was a wild fish, it still is, but it's right at $10 now. Oh my gosh. For a can of herring. But I remember, you know, well, she does, and I remember they were less than a dollar that was on there. Some of them, most of them, the only thing it says on this is product of the USA. But the Canadians, they, that was another thing I need to bring up. That was in we have what's called, well, the species is the blue back river herring. And the reason it's blue back, because it looks blue, it's in the water, and when you take it out, it's blue. That is very, very susceptible to its environment. What I mean by that is water quality especially. There's a lot of things that try to, that has affected it to where it has decreased. You don't see anyone. You don't see anybody catching hair. You don't see anybody dipping hairs. I guess some of y'all remember actually dipping hairs. Anybody in here ever dipped hair? Well, yeah, some of y'all, but anyway, that was a, you don't see that anymore. Why? Because you cannot legally take them, and you have not been able to le legally take them, I would guess, for close to 10 years. No, I'm going to tell you how bad it is. You can't even take them for scientific study. They don't even want you to take them because the numbers are so few that they don't want anything to happen to this indigenous species that's going back and forth still here. That you know, I haven't seen any in years and years. Uh, that's in the sun, but it used to be, you know, they were everywhere, everywhere, and now, poof, they're gone. Um, that's the blue black river herring. It, I don't think it'll go extinct because there are some places it still survives, and that's in, like, <clears throat> the rivers in Maine. Why the rivers in Maine? No pollution. They got very clean water. And Blue Black River Herring seemed to go along fine there. So that's a little hotbed that was uh, where they're hoping eventually they'll expand from there and cover it. But they, uh, they're in bad shape. Now the herring, this herring right here, and this is a jar of herring fillets. Right, they're very tasty when they're fried up on a cold winter's morning. But anyway, they're packed like that, so the fillets in there. Um, these are Atlantic herring. This is a ocean variety that is a separate species from the blue black river herring. Why? Because it does not go up an estuary to spawn. It does all its stuff in the in the mid Atlantic, so it doesn't 
doesn't it doesn't come up in, into so there's there's a few of them. It's a very let's put it this way. It's amazing to me that here's a little end up too. The blue by hair river herring is almost extinct. And those guys, the Atlantic herring, is one of the largest biomasses on earth. Mm -hmm. If you put it in a perspective. That's, I mean, there's plenty of them. So I always thought that was kind of odd too. But I will say this much, the blue back river herring is much more tasty. <laughs> <laughs> That's being prejudice on the Can I ask you a question? Yes. This is a myth. This is what I thought. I thought what you were going to say is, okay, all the sounds and the inlets are, are, are blocked off now, and the herring can't come in here, and we've overfished them. I thought that's what it was all going to be about, but you're saying it's more of the pollution. No, the, the marine fisheries was on this 15 years ago. They started limiting it because they could see a decline in the numbers. You know, <clears throat> they... Uh, they're some pretty smart guys. I was impressed because on some of those committees, there'd be a, a ten panel committee, and eight of them would be PhDs. And the first more, I mean, it's all I could do just to keep up with what they were talking about. But it was we were aware of it, and it was a decline, and the decline came from pollution. It didn't come from over. They thought it at first it was overfishing, and then they said, "Well, no, we don't cut that back and cut that back and cut that back," and they're still declining. So somebody finally figured out, "Well, you know, maybe it's the water quality." And it is, in my mind. So that uh, the blueback river herring is uh, well, it'll be around up there. Yes. I have a question, if I may. Yes. The blueback river herring, did it live its whole life in the estuary or did it come from, was it migratory? It is migratory. It, it is how it goes, Jackie. It, they, they, they spawn up the Roanoke River, the Chowan River, and probably some of them go up the, um, my God, I can't think of the other side of what Tar River County. Tar? Yeah, some of them go up that way. The, but anyway, they are spawned up there, and then they hang around out there until they get a few inches long or three inches long, and then they head to the ocean. And they stay in that ocean for several years, probably three to five years, depending on how much they get to eat and how quickly they grow. And then they turn, like salmon, they turn around and go back to where the river that they were born in, or spawned in, and they will spawn, but they're not going to die, you know? They'll come back out boat and uh, spend a year or two traveling around North Atlantic, seeing the sights, and then they'll come back and spawn again. A lot luckier than salmon, though. Oh, yeah. Salmon <laughs> is uh, one time healing. So, so, as far as um, the, the, now I kind of put it like I said, the perspective, like the food stamps, you know, that killed the, the popularity of it so that um, Atlantic County could step in with no problem because you don't have to worry about blue About when was that? Would you say like in the 30s or no, the well, 40s, the, 50s? that was in the 60s, 60s. when Johnson oh. came out. Okay. I and mean, what the food stamp program with President right. Johnson or Kennedy. So that's to tell you when it was the 60s is when mm -hmm. that started. But you know, it was almost like it just ended. You know, at the, at the end of when they could fish, they had to get licenses, and that stopped a lot. Of well, yeah, well, that was because yeah. you had to pay for a license. Yeah, that, and then, but then it just ended, just with well, the state. There's no about nothing running. Yeah, well, you got to understand something. It was so dramatic yeah. that they wouldn't let the scientific community get a permit to take those fish. They would not let anybody take those fish because there were not enough of those fish to take. So, it, well, <laughs> just, well, like I said, it was a, they think it was a pollution problem that finally got the best of them. That, that, that's what I was told, but that's kind of above my payload. <laughs> what do you think about the overfishing? 
Well, it wasn't an overfishing because oh, they had already the by oh, on the planet. Oh, they're sure. In the Atlantic. Oh, in the Atlantic is it's too regulated. In other words, every day you have to if you whatever if you're in uh, whatever you're doing tuna fishing, uh, shad, you name it, crabbing. Well, I don't think they do it crabs yet, but. If you're in a flying decision, everybody likes flying. You have to get them every day how many you call. And they want to know how close you're getting to. We've got what's called optimum yield, and then you have what's called maximum sustainable yield. Now, you want your optimum yield to be that you're taking 10% of that catch every year or whatever. You know, and the maximum yield might be 30%. Or 20 percent, but you don't want to get close to that because you're, you know, destroying the fishery where it can't reproduce at a satisfactory rate. So you want to try to hit that off and yield, and it takes a lot of information to come up with that because there's a lot of money tied up in a lot of fisheries. But every one of they fishery that I know of, including like scallop fisheries. That was a, been a big success story on that. They just shut it down, and they got a, uh, and didn't let anybody do anything with it for years. And then when it got its got its stocks, the stock built back up to where it could take care of itself. They limited. And I remember like you know Wild West cowboy days. You could go out there and catch all you wanted. Those days are gone. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. I think just about <coughs> everything is gone that's controlled by the federal government. And the state, even the state of Carolina, because here's a myth, here, here's a myth. The state of North Carolina does not own any of its fisheries. In other words, those fish caught this river and this side. We don't own it. The federal government actually owns it, except for like catfish, low value fish, um, white perch, something that's indigenous that's not going out of your territorial waters. But if it migrates in or out, it belongs to the federal government and they control it. It's their fish. And they're going to they're going to dictate what you're going to do as a state to protect that fishery. I'm sorry I got off on this talk about fish politics, but that's that's what happens. I mean the federal government and it's the, what controls it is an organization called the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And there's two representatives supported by the governor that are on that committee. And you, uh, they go up against the federal government scientists about what they think is the best number. Like they'll say, you can land 500,000 pounds of climate, and that's it. You know, and until we see an increase. But that's most of the time this stuff comes back that I've seen in my lifetime. If they say something's in trouble, it's in trouble. Because I mean, it's like, that. well, they went the fire truck by. I mean, you know, it's, the, the thing, the house is on fire when they get involved in it, it is in real bad shape. But, you know, yeah, give them some time to probably, <laughs> the, like I say, the best one is the scallop fish. And shrimp, or own shrimp are spawned in these waters and we have control of those pretty much. And that's a big money maker too. We're supposed to talk about something outside uh, Blueback River here. But uh, <clears throat> shrimp do well and and they, they cultivate oysters. That's an aquaculture thing and they got dining okra coke. If you got okra that's plenty of areas that are, you know, uh, uh, state dolls that people have washer beds and they turn out a pretty good product and that's that's a controlled fishery too because all the all the bottom now is leased out by somebody that's doing an aqu aquaculture has an aquaculture permit for it. Can you and, talk can you talk about crabbing too? I don't want to Oh God they're terrible. <laughs> 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 I guess you do want me to say something about crab. Um <clears throat> Yeah, eat all the crabs you can. Um, <laughs> crab and that is the most valuable fishery in the state of Carolina. And some, you know, people get up there, with it. well, it's like, you know, it can be as high as $85 million or as low as $30 million, depending on what it is. 
And there's only X number of guys out there crabbing. Some of you, you have a really great year. Some of you, you have, you know, uh, a less than great year. And it's just, you know, the summer months, generally I would get, what I'd do, I'd be setting pots in April, and they would come up before Thanksgiving. And you would catch a lot, you know, some of you, you do great at catch crabs. One of the things about crabs here, and we're fortunate, is that we have what is called just so that well, according to this guy lives in Eden, we have a jimmy hole. Well, what's a jimmy hole? A jimmy hole is where there's a lot of boy crabs hanging out. And at this end of the Albemarle sign, it has the right salinity, which is low salinity, and, uh, you know, these crabs, these boys, crabs like it. If the girl crabs come up from the sign, they will push those jimmies up the roof because they just hard to get along with. <laughs> I mean, I swear, I've seen it, you know, all these jimmy crabs are back up in the corner and this one female's in there. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's rough, but the uh, you gotta have them. That's in it. But that's your most valuable. We would fish until November. One of the uh, perks of it was is that you know we get soft crabs, and that's a very tasty uh, thing. Would you say that, Jackie? Uh, Best food there is. Uh, yeah, and we're, we're fortunate on that. If you, and you can get a recreational license. Let me go ahead and say it to a commercial fishing license is expensive. But, well, it's not too, depending on what year, but when you've got more than one, about $400 a year to maintain that license. And you can, if you're over 65 to 200. And you can get a recreational crabbing license for like $30. And you can go out there and set pots and um, go with your mates and have a grand time throwing crab pots upside down. Uh, and drink a lot of beer. So, yeah, I've, I've done that a few times. Is there, are there any rules about where you can crab? I know... Like, no, it's, no the... it's what we refer to as an open fishery. Open, open, okay. Yeah, you can, wherever you can throw that pot, you can't throw it in a, in a navigable channel. Okay. You know, like you can't... Yeah. Uh, into a docking area, someplace where somebody's going to get their propeller fouled. But anywhere else, and that's a very small percentage of what's there. You throw them wherever you think those crabs are going to be. And and what are the months that, that this is done? What, what's the best crabbing month? What's the crab, best when, crab? When, when do you Well, crab? really, if you, you know, I mean, if you were commercially, well, and I would say this month, if I'm doing a regulation, <laughs> recreationally, I would like somewhere like June or July, on a pier with an umbrella and a bunch of cold beer and a pot or, you know, just a stream with a fish head on it. But if you're doing it commercially, it's in, it's in April when the crabs are waking up and they are very, very hungry. Uh -huh. So you will catch a lot of them. And then as the summer progresses, it falls off. What do they use for bait? Uh, small children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, when I was a lad, we used Terrence because there were so there's so many of them, and they freeze them. And, you them. and then now they use another fish called a menhaden. Uh -huh. Years ago, somebody figured out that if you use shrimp heads, that crabs like them in certain areas. Up here with these Jimmy crabs, shrimp heads work good. They work better than you know fish, uh, menhaden, uh, or whatever else you get you know cheap. You know, I mean cheap, so, because you, you're going through hundreds of pounds of that every day. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, it's a money thing, it's just making it last point. So when you go to the farmer's market and fellas uh, selling crab and tuna and all that, this is all real local stuff. Right. Okay. Right, it's local. It is that. Uh, I guess I went out there more than anything else, call it not, but the entertainment value in the place. Because I enjoyed, you know, just being out there, seeing these people, and talking about crabs. But the uh, the money bank part of it went to Hertford to uh, oh gosh, what's his name over there? I'm trying to back us. He uh, he bought well. Um, Nixon's was a big crab buyer too. But he buy them. They buy them everywhere. I mean, it's like you know, 
you know, auto parts and crab bar. I mean, it was, <laughs> that, it, it, yeah, whatever, because in the spring of the year, you can take these crabs, and when I was a kid, you know, we got $2 a bushel for crabs. You know, wow, that was great. I've sold them for, you know, $165 a bushel. I'm still trying to make money. <laughs> They're expensive now, so. <laughs> I can't make any money. When they were $2, I'm still trying to make money. You know, $165. I thought I got, you just don't understand. But, uh, yes, you know, the crabs are very important to us. It's the most valuable fishery in the state. And then I would say that sometimes that falls back because you have really big shrimp years and the shrimp come in. And, you know, we pay the mortgage off. I mean, you know, they have a... Have what was this year like? Is they there anybody well. in Eden to know that fishes, I mean, crabs for... A, All the time? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, there's some, still some knotheads that, they that are. Yeah, are still out there that, that do it. Um, it's a more of a seasonal thing, uh, Virginia. Than a, than a year round thing. It's kind of yeah. like when I was a young man, there were people that could make a living dying there on the outer banks as an oysterman. But you don't see that anymore. Everybody else is an oysterman and a tuna fisherman, or he's an oysterman and he's a uh, you know crabber, or he's something else besides just one thing. Because no, no, there's too many. There's there's too much restrictions on on one species. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned Menhaden. Yes. Um, is it still is it still a, one North Carolina one of the last ones to have the, the outlaw Menhaden plants? Yeah. Well, I remember reading something about it, but it's still that uh, uh, was it Omega Protein up in Virginia, up at Rappahannock, up that way. Well, yeah, the Great Conca. All right. Anyway, they're still doing it, and they still catch them. But yes, they are very very controlled. There, Menhaden are where Herring were 10 years ago under a control situation because, like I say, it's controlled by the Atlantic States Marine Fishing Commission and their job is to make sure that those fish don't go extinct. So they'll do what they have to do. And I agree, agree with them because all of them have been good servants. What else? But I got to wait. I got to wait. Yes, sir. What's the story on spots? They only bite hooks with worms on them? No. They, uh, they'll bite uh, whatever, ADL. <laughs> yeah, uh, they like blood worms. I fish one in LA, they'll bite with, with shrimp on it. They'll bite with cut bait, just trying to hook. It's a fish. Uh -huh. You know, they'll eat it. But generally, the best time to get spots is in November, coming up, down the piers. Mm -hmm. If you like those big yellow belly spots mm -hmm. with the fins, yellow fins. They're the best ones to salt or corn up, but it's just these guys and burn nixes. I thought those were brim. Oh no. Uh -uh. Those big yellow things? Uh -uh. The, the yellow ones that if you go to, you get some corn spots, you go to, to Murray Nix and look at those spots and in November they have yellow fins. They're spots. They got a spot. They got right a there. spot, yeah. Right there. You know, they're not but their there. fins are all spiky. Yeah, well, they have to protect them. Are they good to eat? Yes, I like them salty too. I guess I'm going to die younger and younger, but uh, <laughs> I like they salt spots too. They're delicious. You know, I've got very few fish that I, I met I didn't like eating. I mean, I enjoyed them. I've been fortunate. Well, now, is that good enough? You want to go? That's good enough. But, I mean, anyone want to ask questions? Anything yeah, you about can that? ask me some questions. Sam, you have Dossie yes. currently. Um, do, do the predators? Go after those blueback, you know, like stripers. Oh, and yeah, and yes. I mean, did that put a dent in them? Yes, yes. It's a big food fish. It's just, yeah, it, 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 it has a lot of prey. Does that change the balance? Yeah, well, I mean, there's no, there are no, well, you got everybody. I mean, killer whales right on down, you know, to um, uh, all fish try and eat them. But because I mean, because it's, it's a good food fish the, for whatever, it's got it's got a high calorie content on those uh, blueback herrings. There, well, any herring for that matter. But there's a uh, there's a lot of problems out there in the echoes in the, in the oceans right now. Yes. If they don't let the scientists 
sample how many herring are there, how do they know how many herring well, are there? Well, you can get them. This is how, this is how that works. <clears throat> They're all the time sampling for other species, okay, in the North Atlantic or wherever. And those blueback herring will show up in these other catching devices, primarily gillnet or, or an otter trawl. They'll show up. They're not targeted by a scientific community, but they'll show up and they say, well, gee, you know, <coughs> last year we didn't get any, and this year we got a thousand. So they must be turning around, you know, just by sheer numbers, that they can, can deduce that there's more and more. Because all that stuff's available online. Um, I, know, I know of people in the Rock River yeah. that will fish them now and they say they're back. Well, that's good. But to, to, before they, the, well, I mean, I'm not a, a fishery scientist and I don't make policy. I just go to, go to the meetings and hear what a lot of smart people have to say about it. But you need enough stock in an area to be born so that they're uh, indigenous to that area. And then once you get a good, stable population, you go back in there and you take out 5%, 10%, or whatever. If they, if they just showed up, they want them to keep showing up in larger and larger numbers, and then they you know, get their fishing on. And it's, uh, I used to think about it because, wow, look at all this stuff, all this out here, and we didn't do anything except make up some, you know, a few rules and laws, and every year we can come back and get all this, all these fish, crabs, shrimp. All you gotta do is figure out some way to protect the resource, and you can come back and draw from that well every year. But uh, and I guess here's the other thing: is some states are better than others. When I say that, like Alaska has a very aggressive marine fisheries. North Carolina has a very aggressive marine fisheries. Texas, no. But, you know, Florida, no. But some states are more aggressive on trying to take care of their fishery in light of the federal government. And, you know, uh, it goes back to whatever you said. There's just not enough fish to go around for everybody. And what I mean by that is the uh, Sport fishing industry or recreational fishing industry has exploded over the past, you know, 40 years. Yeah. And, got, and then you got the commercial end of it on the other side of it. And they got along with that pretty good. And even the commercial people realize, I mean the recreational realize that there's just not enough fish. So they put more and more limits. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did North Carolina ever get involved in the crab wars that kind of came up between Maryland and Virginia, or is our population discreet from theirs? Yeah, uh, yeah, our, we're, yes, we're, uh, the way that falls out, Jackie, is that Virginia catches more crabs than anybody, okay, because it's got huge, I mean, as far as the most, most crabs are in Virginia, and it has strong small. And then between Maryland and North Carolina, sometimes Maryland's number two, Sometimes North Carolina's number two. But all of our crabs are shipped either to Virginia or Maryland. Most of them are shipped to Maryland. When, if I'm here and I'm getting $150 for a bushel of crabs, can you imagine what somebody's going to put in Baltimore for those crabs? Yeah, I. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 100 dollars a dozen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. We, we just, all we do is send them up there. Of, of course, somebody said that, you know, 90% of Maryland crabs are from North Carolina, which is probably true. <laughs> but as soon as they cross that state line, they're Maryland. They're Maryland. <laughs> yes. So what is it about the herring skeletal structure that is so unique that we refer to the herring bone versus any other fish's bone structure. I, you, you got me. I don't know, I just know that a herring bone, you know, it looks good on a soup, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have what to tell you. I mean, they, they do have nice looking, you know, skeletal. <laughs> but they call it a herring bone because it looks, you know, what it is. Yes. How's the increase in gas price 
It went up 20 cents today from here to Smithfield. 20 cents a gallon everywhere. And uh, how does that impact you guys? Well, you buy your, you, what you do is, this is how it went for me. I had a two-cycle gas burner with a two-cycle gasoline engine. They got terrible economy. And then when gas started going up, I got a four-cycle that it would cut my consumption, daily consumption, in half. And then you can, well, then I went and got a third one that was even a more efficient Honda motor because I was burning a lot. Of, well, anyway, that cut it, cut it back down. So you got to keep trying to find the most. Well, the other part of that is you're more, you figure out where you're going with your pots to where you don't, you have, you do the least running around. Yeah. You try to conserve your fuel that's in there. But most of these young guys are cowboys there, and when I say that, they'll go out there and put, you know, 350 horsepower motor on the back of a 20 foot skiff, and it will literally fly. But when you're single and you don't have any problems, fine. I mean, they'll, they'll just they'll make it happen on land. Yes, yes, John. I have two questions. You can answer either of them uh, as you choose, or even both. One is, um, what is you, when somebody asks you how to uh, river herring out in the ocean? How do they know which river and which creek to go back and return to? And then my other question is, um, I've had heard some people theorize that one of the problems with the herring is. Um, light pollution, in other words, t too much light all night um, in the places. And I just wonder what your opinion is on either one of those. Well, the, on the first one there, that it's the same thing on Blueback River here, and it is on salmon. There, when they're born, that water <coughs> molecule, you know, is embedded in their nostrils or whatever. And they can find that <coughs> molecule again, however slight it is. That's, they ask how they get back to the chemistry of that water is born into that fish, so it knows, you know, where to go. And it's, a, it's amazing that all that molecules out there can track on that. And uh, on the, uh, what was that second question? Light pollution. Light, yeah, that is, that's a good question because there are some species, and that was, that was, that was true because we thought about that too. There were, the state of North Carolina, when it was trying to uh, increase the population of blue black river herring, there was this stream management or creek management where they went in there and there, somebody would put a road across there and they would put in a long, dark culvert. A culvert, you know, for just driving over like you go down the highway. <clears throat> And some species, they realized, would not go down the long, dark tunnel because they were, for, well, for whatever reason, predators or what. So they had to go back and tear those out and put bridges up to where it had enough light going in that they felt comfortable. Yes, it would stop them. Now, I don't know every species or whatever, and I don't know if it was, you know, six feet or 600 feet, but it definitely, I mean, I read a paper on that, so I thought that was interesting. I just want to point something out to you, uh, to everybody else that you shared with me, that in 1861, a reporter from Harper's <laughs> came to Chowan and did a huge spread about the herring industry. And did you say a copy of that is also at the courthouse? The courthouse. On the wall. On the wall. So That's if you right. want, but I just was reading a couple uh, things about it that. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And there's a lot of pictures of how they do the seines. And they uh, showed the, are these Indian? No, this is, they're not, that, yeah, that's, the same. That's the same fishery. And the, uh, the individuals there were, were the slaves that were, you know, were doing it. Now, some of them might have been free, but most of them were slaves. And they'd be out there cutting right. fish and packing fish and whatever, you know. Yeah, they talk about the hauling of the seine, and then they have a picture of the night haul, and it's mostly blacks just in the water with these nets trying to corral the herring, I guess. And then the next picture they have are the, the, the heading of the herring, herring yeah. and all these black women, you know, well, heading the herring and cleaning them out.
When you I was a child, paid for all the road. Yeah, you, you say know, the, the ones up at uh, Cannon's Ferry used to get paid yeah. extra for the road. Yes. That they cleaned out. Uh, okay. That's right. Yeah. And it was a it was a very valuable you know uh, resource for this area when it was desperately needed, especially after the Civil War. Yeah. That uh, to get them back on their feet. So we're on it was North Carolina has got some problems, but they're working their way through with food. When I say it's got some problems, every state that has a marine fisheries, other than, you know, somebody's got plenty of money. When I say money, I mean Alaska. And it's not from fish, it is from oil that they get all their money, and then they can buy the very best research. So we're not quite there yet, but uh, North Carolina is, 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 is heading in the right direction. And it'll take a while. But it'll be, it's like anything else, you know, everybody would like to keep it clean and, you know, look out for everything that you can. <coughs> that you can. Yeah. Are there any other questions that I can ask? I asked, I, I, I asked Dante a non-push question. I asked him, are we ever going to get a ferry? He said they built the ferry. Yeah. But now it's just trying to find ways of... Um, coming in and having places to hook up at the different places. And then right. you said it was also like seasonal. It seems like in the well, summer it would be very viable, but it wouldn't be in the winter. Yeah, in the summertime, and it uh, and the spring and the summer when it's real nice, the weather's nice and everything. Yeah, but it would go pretty good. But in, you know, January, February, you know, it's kind of, you know, the ridership just drops, right. just goes nothing. Everybody's just... just Nice and it would do, I would like to see it come in. Yeah, and so for those of you who are new, there's talk about having a ferry system that would connect Edenton to uh, Columbia to, to Plymouth. Plymouth to the Outer Banks. Hard to forget. Yeah, Outer Banks would be a tough, tough run, but yeah, they could yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, that Elmer was not a comfortable body of water. No. Yeah. You know, especially if you're hammering it at about 30 plus knots. It, uh, yeah, I guess you can get this shook up. But he said the boat, is, the boat has been, he showed me a picture. <laughs> he said, the boat's been built. So well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, the first thing, I, when I looked at it, I, I would have took that, that uh, Miami blue that they've got and turned that oh, into. the color? Yeah, the color turned it into Eden and green or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I would do. That's the first thing I'd do. Where is, it, where is it docked now? It's right now. It's in, uh, down near New Bern at, at, the, at the ferry headquarters of a place we call Cherry Branch. That's the wrong sound. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Are they talking about sh sharing a, a, a ferry that would do the Albemarle Sound and the Pemlico? Uh, I don't know what uh, the powers to be's plan okay. is. That's, now, right. that, that's that, another talk. That, <laughs> They, they originally, that, that boat was supposed to go to Hatteras and just bring tours from Hatteras down to Ocracoke and then run them back, ferry them back and forth between Hatteras parking lot and Ocracoke Village. And they got little trams that run around and pick you up and run you all over the village. I mean, you can take a bicycle around there and ride around. And then get on in that evening and go home and get in your car. But it's, it's, it's just a pedestrian trip. That's what this is, it's that's a pedestrian. It, that's, it. And yeah. the best I can remember, I think it's, it's $10 a head now. It used to be free. That was to get everybody in it. And then, it's, it, but it stays busy. I mean, it yeah. works yeah. for these people. I'm glad it does. Well, Dante, thank you so much. I learned a whole lot. Thank you guys.